everybody. You are listening to I'm Over It. My name is Atlanta Decaterne Taylor, and this is my podcast. Hello, everybody. I am here with Miss Bonnie Wright. She is a filmmaker and uh, the real deal environmental activist. You probably have seen her Instagram at Bonnie Wright. With a W, <laughs> one word, right? Um, my Instagram knows this is be right. It's oh kind of, fuck! I, I got to Instagram too late. Someone had taken my name. Oh god! Well, actually, though, that kind of is. Did you mean it to be like do the right thing? Oh yeah, I mean yeah. It was just. I think it was at a time when like other people were doing that kind of hand. Like a, right. I, no, I honestly, I wanted to change it forever, but at this point, no, I've heard that. Just I've had have to deal with it. Right, like. Billie Eilish with the We Are the Avocados, right? Oh, right. Yeah, Do you yeah, know yeah. who she yeah. is? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, when people were doing the funny names yeah. before Instagram yeah, was like yeah. the way of paying the bills. It's always reflective where, like, of when you signed on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, oh. Atlanta Bean, for example. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so we're in Venice outdoors, which is really cool. Very Los Angeles. We're in Los Angeles at Bonnie's home. Mm hmm outdoors and it's a beautiful beautiful day it is very good did you move to venice to be close to the ocean i did <laughs> yeah um so i originally from london i lived in new york for two years and then i sort of made my way across to here which is just bizarre because i never ever thought i would live in la i was such a city girl from london i you know grew up right in the center of london went to school on the subway like walked everywhere I was so used to you know history and culture on my doorstep and I never thought I would live here and it made me I think LA is one of those places it's not great to visit but I love living here mm -hmm. um, and I was living in New York and loving it and it really came at a time that I needed to be kind of like woken up a little bit and sort yeah. of shaken around and and just leave home and just figure out who I was on my own um, and then I just kept thinking every time I've been like really happy, I've been by the beach, whether or not it's been in LA on vacation or in Australia where my mum's side of the family live. And I was like, maybe like while I can and while I haven't got specific like um, ties with my work to New York, mm -hmm. um, like I may as well give it a go. So with always the knowledge that I wanted to be in Venice, having fortunately like stayed at so many friends' houses across yeah. the years of like different pockets of LA, knowing that this was where I wanted to be. And I was just really excited to just have that little bit more space, like yeah. not only kind of in my home, but also just in my environment, just like the spatial kind of suddenly my periphery opening up a little bit, like I had got my nervous system was just like wired from being mm -hmm. in New York and, and constantly sort of traveling and never really actually coming back to somewhere where I could sort of chill out. Like I was in yeah. this, I think I had been for a very long time in a very fight or flight sort of mode. And yeah, so I'm here still was- in that <laughs> mode. <laughs> it's like constant state. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, oh, and it was, yeah. And it's, and I've been here three years now and I've really loved it. Was it weird to sort of get into the level of LA or like to sort of decompress because I know when I come here at first I'm like go move faster get me the coffee like you yes. know that sort of New York oh, yeah, yeah. pace of life that here is just like so hard for me like it is difficult but it's it really I mean even in that it was just like a, a practice of slowing down because I was like it, it, clearly in that moment of like you know standing behind someone who was like ordering something and then like Ch how a are you a triple mocha like, frappuccino like yeah, yeah not only the order is ridiculous but also <laughs> so it's crazy like, here how's your day it's so beautiful outside what do you and i was like w uh, and, and clearly just felt it was in gen you know not genuine really yeah in that kind of british sort of mentality right, and yeah. also having been in new york for two years and then you find yourself like having those you know like, moments yourself and you're like fuck wow am I? yeah <laughs> but it's been really interesting and i think not only la but i think just an american mentality has kind of actually been really useful for me in a very sort of in i'm such a natural kind of introvert i'm really quiet until i get to know someone like pretty much use as few words as possible until i get to know someone and my claws are in and it's just like non-stop what's your star sign i'm in aquarius okay yeah and yeah, so it has just been being, you know, having this time 
in the States has been a really interesting way for me to kind of speak up a bit more about who I think I am and what I think I like to do. And whereas, I mean, I guess the extreme of that sometimes can rub me the wrong way. And this kind of idea that like, I can be me, you know, it's often used a lot. Whereas rather than kind of more of a sort of communal we or just like mm. talking about things outside ourselves. Yeah. But I think I did need to sort of like speak up for myself a little bit. I think my you too felt quiet. you felt like you didn't get to have that in London. No, and I think that is just a it's a very yes. you know self deprecating quiet like don't you know yeah. like don't indulge in your own kind of like feelings or sort of healing or like just figuring yeah. things out. It's kind of it's no it's, it's not like that's not mental like health thing. therapy not a thing although it's beginning to it is, become yeah, hugely, yeah. which is great but yeah no my I mean you know I was born in London mm -hmm. and both my parents are British so I've experienced a version yeah. of that which I still really uh, love self-deprecating humor yeah. like and I think that that's the very British part of me sure. that like that sort of you know sarcastic I've had to actually temper it a little bit because <laughs> yeah. it used Sometimes to be it does not sail with people at no all. and like you're like i'm really not trying to insult you it's actually my way of showing <laughs> yeah, love <laughs> yeah this is me loving you like yeah. you're getting a lot of hate right now <laughs> i'm like trust me like this is how i show my love is i am kind of <laughs> sassy with you yeah 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 so you <clears throat> Did you? When did you sort of start getting really into the environmental activist stuff? Was that before your move here, or was it kind of like when you got here, you developed that more and more? You know. Or? Yeah, I think. I think you know from day one of being a kid. I think being just like not wasteful was something that like was very much like ingrained in my family in the sense of, you know, we never like bought huge grocery shops we only ever kind of lived day by day whether or not it's just because we didn't know what we were doing living that kind of city life you don't know what you're going to be up to that night right um and we never really had that kind of sort of extreme kind of consumption or getting just loads of excess snacks things that we didn't need like it was kind of just quite simple and and sort of also whole foods in the sense that it wasn't like right. processed which often sadly that's like when a lot of waste happens is in those more convenient foods. Um, and so that I think was just part of me. And then every weekend when I was a kid, we went to our, we had a house on the beach, very not like here in the Pacific yeah, on no, the English yeah, yeah. Channel, so quite yeah. different. Um, but you know, somewhere that every weekend, you know, we'd leave school on a Friday and go yeah, to, yeah, yeah. And, and it's just Where like was freedom. It? In East Sussex, it's, okay. yeah. And so, you know, we just played in the sand and there was nothing, there was no, I guess there were no activities to do, but like what you could see. So I was totally. that kind of a imagination of just like the elements of being in front of you was I guess as well, yeah. subconsciously. And then I think more in the more recent years, I think slowly, I guess, becoming more interested in, you know, being more, more sort of mindful, whether or not that's through kind of wellness and, and, and a meditation practice. And, and I think that just like slowed me down to sort of just realize my interaction with things. And then with the environment, I, you know, firsthand from traveling and understanding kind of waste issues and, and then yeah. also being in the water and being in the ocean surfing. Um, I experience, you know, seeing single-use plastics float by and, and the trash that's right. on beaches and different things. And I wrote this uh, article when they were trying to, in England, make these uh, plastic-free shopping aisles, essentially, that would sort of be an example of, like, how you could shop without plastics, which sadly never got passed and never mm -hmm. happened. But it was that article that then Greenpeace in the UK um, saw. And they approached me to sort of collaborate and do something with them and that ended up being in the form of joining them on part of a trip that they did down the Atlantic coast here um, stopping in different ports to essentially be there for people to come on board get a tour of like what Greenpeace is what the activists on board do and just educate around the topic of predominantly ocean plastics and offshore drilling and so I went on a part of that and just like just fell in love with all of the um, people on board in, in terms of their sort of passion and commitment towards yeah. it. And mm. and we did things like trawling for microplastics, which is when you kind of like drop a net and you pull it alongside the ship wow, and you take yeah. um, 
uh, samples and then you put that into a broader data collection that's happening globally by anyone. You know, anyone can be part of um, that research. And yeah, I kind of left thinking that like all I needed to be doing every day was this, yeah, you know, no, you leave know. in this very, and then you naturally begin to sort of learn every day more and more about it, the more interested you become and, and you kind of think, okay, where in this hugely overwhelming thing, like yeah. where can I find my path within it that isn't gonna totally overwhelm me every day? I really struggle with that in my, I, I was gonna say like, I feel like the more aware I get, the more I educate myself on, mm -hmm. you know, like I was saying, even understanding gender politics and trying to get understand that the more information I get the more research I do the more I read the more the more I want to learn you know and then you get really deep in it where yeah. you're just like gutted yeah fully you know? gut yeah and and I've had times where I'm sort of like what's going on why am I feeling this way and it's like whoa it's that it's because yeah. I'm and also now my for the first time in the past year, my you know narrative work in my filmmaking yeah. is beginning to be entirely about this too. So literally, it's not like that's a separate kind of thing yeah. that I do, and then I go off and tell completely different stories, or I go off and have a day mm -hmm. job or something. Like everything now is crossing over intentionally because I want to, you know, my best way to express myself and kind of push a question or a narrative is through storytelling yeah. and filmmaking in a narrative not and fictional way because you studied writing and directing mm -hmm. so do you write and direct all of your films and um not all of them so up until quite recently i did sort of both write and direct um the first i then had a piece that was an adaptation of a short story by a british author called a.s by it so i did the script which one was that that was called medusa's ankles okay and so I did this script adaptation of it, but it was, you know, her original story. And then after that, I did a um, small little web series with a friend. That was like the last project I shot when I was in New York called Phone Calls. And he wrote that and I directed it. And he was writing and I was like, you know, this would make a great little TV show mm -hmm. kind of. So that was really fun to just come in there and work with someone's, you know, material. Right. So that was fresh and new to me. And then I started writing, I guess since I graduated, um, which is I think like seven years ago, since then it's always been, you know, the goal to work towards making my first feature film. And, and these last seven years have been me like figuring out who I am, what I want to say, and just creating a portfolio of my work. And you so- You have a great portfolio, by the thanks. way. You have, yeah. I was Bon Bon Lumiere. I yeah. was on there checking <laughs> it out. I was like, you have so much stuff on yeah, there, yeah. all the way from a music video to, you know, separate, separate we come, mm -hmm. separate we go, which is really beautiful. You, and, yeah. um, you know, I, I mean, that's a great spectrum of stuff. Yeah, I felt really sort of, I mean, it's just been, it was just been really nice to slow down and work at a pace that was fully sort of from me, uh, having come from an experience in a huge, you know, studio um, production I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> to, to uh, 10 years to then go to college when I was sort of still working on Harry Potter at the end and and so it was I really loved having a full seven years just like doing things on like a small way a smaller scale and yeah I mean you have to do that though yeah, right you do, yeah. like I years think to, in order to sort of regain your kind of ownership and voice you sort of have to like take it back in that way well you almost lost your childhood in a way like you got to have an incredible experience just so you guys know Bonnie was Ginny Weasley in the Harry Potter series so you didn't get to have that normal experience of discovering yourself and figuring out what you like you know I, I didn't really either because I started working at 15 and yeah. traveled all around where I didn't get to develop my sense of what motivated me what I love what I was drawn to because mm -hmm. I was just doing what was immediately in front of me yeah you know because I was working mm -hmm. And so, yeah, now you probably get to pause and be like, okay, cool, I, you know, found, did you find your love of film in that experience? Yeah, definitely. I mean, my sort of exposure, obviously, to the industry was entirely during that process of filmmaking. I mean, I started so young that it couldn't have really been from anywhere else, almost. I mean, then obviously it became my own love of, you know, watching and understanding and appreciating film, but it was, you know, those productions had the people working on them in terms of the crew and 
and the craftsmanship behind those films were just like of such high value that I'm so lucky that and fortunate that I was a really curious kid and I yeah. love to sort of ask questions and, and you, you know you're coming from a space where you're not really shy to ask questions that seem you're ridiculous nine. to your kids so you're like what does that button do what does this do and like why are you like, putting what's this, this here? button do yeah. press everything destroys deletes the yeah. entire yeah. scene yeah so and and the patience that they had you know for those questions was incredible and when I wasn't filming and I didn't have schoolwork to catch up on I did lots of sort of work experience like internship kind of vibes in different departments so I did like Starting the art age. department <laughs> you're like starting at 10 <laughs> yeah 10 I'm like that like let, let me draw this <laughs> um pinning but, yeah. the pinning the costumes <laughs> yeah yeah just working people and <laughs> um so yeah that was fun I mean to be able to have that so it came from from that and I think it came that level of like people were so good at what they did and they yeah. worked really hard to get to that and my parents are both jewelry designers and and they make and work you know they work with the metal and I grew up very much seeing them as craftsmanship yeah wow. as, and so I have very much like a respect and reverence for time that needs to be put into the work mm-hmm. to sort of not only know like the foundations but just from doing things rather than like I think we live in a world where it's like we speak a lot about the yeah. things we do and that we want to do, but until you kind of go and quietly do them. You're the real deal up. though. You you are <laughs> really like the activism you are out there doing. And I really, really, really admire that about you because, you. you know, as we were just talking about, it's like you were given this opportunity, right? Like being put in the Harry Potter films at nine mm-hmm. and now you know that would have given you an opportunity to really do act for your entire life probably right and you decided to do something else with your platform yeah and I find that really admirable yeah I mean I continue to sort of act a bit after the Harry Potter films and different sort of independent films and theater and tv and you know I found it really fun because suddenly I was playing a different character and it was like whoa my world just opened up and I was on different productions that were in all varying scales and I was like oh wow you can make movies in and be directed in so many different ways Mm. which made me feel more kind of hopeful that I could make my own films it made it made it suddenly feel more accessible like oh okay right I can go and do this like my way it doesn't have to be this way this only way I've experienced things but I think, you know, more and more, I just wasn't, I just, it didn't answer my, it didn't, it didn't work with my strengths as a, as a, I mean, personality wise. And I just, my feet were just like, I was too, like on a, I just couldn't sit there and just act on a film set. I was so fascinated by like, in my head, I would just spend my entire day like guessing what I thought the director would say or like seeing what are they going to do for the next setup and like what are they angling going to do and how are they going to edit that. And and I, my mind was just clearly not on the performance. Yes. It was like on everything else. <laughs> um, so and and so it was amazing just when I suddenly was like, OK, I'm fully going to stop, which is a terrifying thing, a choice to make because I was so worried that you know, if I stop going up for things, if I stop auditioning and, you know, go and acting, that I would close this door on this world that had been, like, really, pr- like, fruitful for me. And right. I had to do it because I was neither doing one or the other to the best of my ability. Mm. And going back to my, like, respect of, like, putting the hours in and the craftsmanship, I felt like I was, like, not really living that truth at all. No, I feel that. Yeah, I was going to say, like, were you scared at any point? You know, I feel like, for me, I studied acting for two years and I like really fell in love with it Mm -hmm. and started auditioning and I was like oh this is what I want to do I was getting like really incredible feedback which was so bizarre I hadn't had like feedback like that Mm -hmm. in ages it's like oh wow thank (laughs) you um but I remember like doing an audition one day where I was like a cheerleader or something and like it was right around there was some like political stuff going on and I was like I just can't do this when there are so many other things going on in Mm -hmm. the world like I couldn't live in ignorance of that, you know? And it was yeah. hard because you're like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do next. I yeah, have no sure. idea, yeah. but 
I but knew that that wasn't right. Yeah, right. and often just knowing, sometimes knowing what you don't like is as important as finding That's, something you do like. Well, yeah. I find it's a lot easier actually to figure out what I don't want. Yeah. Than, like, I, Which even we often are never asked and never do, really. People aren't, you know, that psych, like, oh, I don't want to hate on things and I don't want to like. And, yeah. and it's just like, no, you know, I prefer, I don't don't particularly gel well with those kind of people or that yeah. kind of like environment or whatever I think is important rather yeah. than being like I like what do you like it's yeah like, no, I, I know, know what I like <laughs> no, I know I'm like I, I mean I also it was so hard for me to figure out what I liked because also as we were just saying like I never had the time to really explore that I mean yeah. I also like I definitely grew up you know with my mom we lived in like Beechwood Canyon and I used to play in the trees i played a game called tarzanas which was <laughs> my female equivalent of tarzan where yeah. i would like run around naked i used to make like fairy houses and like you know we had all these birds and i totally had that like sense of imagination yeah and then i guess just from my own like stuff with like addiction and working and this and that i just sort of lost that yeah you know and now i'm beginning to get it back i mm -hmm. think at you know 20 yeah and to be able to be in a world where like your imagination is like valid and like needed at the table whereas yeah. for so many people that is kind of the daydreaming from yeah. what you need to be doing and so it's nice to be able to have that but i do think you know as we've obviously become an incredibly visual mm -hmm. kind of generation and, and time we're in i think for people who friends of mine who naturally are not sort of quote unquote creative which is a word that I don't love but let's say use it yeah um you know they can still have this outlet of something like Instagram or just taking photos personally on their own yeah. phone mm -hmm. to in their own quiet way like have some sort of lens on what they see yeah whereas I think before it's like you're either one or the other you know it's yeah. like we're operating on a kind of like right or left brain thing and it's like do you ever get uninspired? Yeah, for sure. I hate, I've been like, I had that recently and I was like freaking out about mm -hmm. it. Cause I was like, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. Like, you know, and I, I mean, my boyfriend is super creative. And so he was kind of, he was like, I'm glad you're uninspired because that means then you have to learn how to get yourself inspired for again. Sure, yeah. Cause that was, you know, I never really thought I was a creative person yeah. either. Um, but yeah, like, what do you do when you're just like, yeah, it's hard. I think especially when you're, you know, when my work is essentially like coming up with stories mm -hmm. and, 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 and finding ways that I can like <clears throat> make stories that will help me process what I'm questioning about the world and how I see things and or how I see other people seeing things. And I think more and more I've just learned that like inspiration isn't like a given thing and it isn't just gonna like come flying past and you sort of like grab it like a leaf blowing by and it's not gonna like land on your table and all those things I think it is like there's a lot of work in yeah. inspiration and creativity and I think on days where clearly my brain is not outputting anything I just I'm like okay it's an input day it's how I like call it in my mind and I'm like I just need to like leave my space and go and read watch things just like just take things in because I clearly am not nothing is coming out today that's super helpful yeah and like, I just to think of it as that it like input output days because yeah. yeah I do you ever like what's your news consumption you know what I think I think my news is so I always realize that it's so skewed towards like what I'm interested in mm -hmm. and a lot of my work especially in the current space I'm in with some projects it's like big research kind of things and this is all research that's happening currently um around sort of the future of our climate and the environment but I just then go in you know we were saying you just then get completely overwhelmed and then you go in this kind of mm -hmm. paralysis where you just can't yeah. look or see anything so I would say my news consumption is pretty low in terms of just like general kind of you know worldly news in the sense of what's happening more politically but I would say I am aware that it's quite skewed but even within that one line of interest I have yeah. I always try and read around the very opposing kind of opinions and huh, thoughts on that because until we sit down with the people that are denying what's like 
very much coming at us, Mm -hmm. then we can't change anything. I think it's like until you, until you kind of be an ally to people who don't have access to these things that you think are really important, Mm. then how is it gonna, like you're just gonna be speaking to a, you know, converted group of people already right. which is more infuriating really R- why because i think because you'll f- you feel really powerless because you're like these people know i know what now like Ugh, oh you know interesting whereas if you're like speaking to people who genuinely are learning something for the first time like wow i never knew that like by buying this or making this choice it's having this impact and people are like wow i didn't know that like just in that moment it's like there's like a spark in that yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and more of a sort of sense of hope in a sometimes very overwhelming issue. Whereas if you're speaking to other people who sometimes have, you know, a lot of my friends have very similar understanding of right. the environment and the issue. And we just end up going in these spirals of just like, whoa, we just really went bleak for like an hour. We need to yeah. pull out and then I'll feel like really hopeless. Yeah, that's, that's actually a really interesting idea. Cause I'm definitely also surrounded by a lot of my friends. We feel the same way. Yeah. And yeah, it is at a point you're just like, okay, well, like, how is this ever going to change, you know? And you're trying to do so, you're trying to do things in your own way and be helpful. But then, yeah, sometimes you're like, oh, fuck, you know? like, And, you know, you're living in, you know, very much bubbles of cities that are very progressive. And I think... I think in those, even though I've had those moments of just being like, we need, how do we, you know, how do I connect and to people who, you know, this isn't at the forefront of their mind because they've got mm-hmm. a million other things that they're worrying about that day. And how do you create, you know, access to say products that are more reusable, which will save, you know, if if I am fortunate to have a bunch of different reusable bottles in my, you know, kitchen, and I think that's the answer to, you know, lowering a massive impact of single use plastic, well, how much can I say that until you speak to people who, A, can't at first even have the money that day to afford that bottle or don't actually have access to water that is deemed clean or, you know, it's yeah, until yeah, yeah. you, that's the, so it's hard. That stuff overwhelms me because there's only so much you can how do connect you- with bridge that gap then like how do you I think more and more as I've kind of got into it I've just realized that at the end of the day like all we can do is our own thing Mm -hmm. like all we have is ourselves and the individual even if we're on a progressive kind of tangent you just hope that the world slowly will catch up as the awareness and education spreads And all you can do is just like live what you believe is something and and for sure share things you believe about and resources through social media. But at the end of the day, like we we can only do ourselves and know that in this overwhelming thing, you know, when you're faced with like huge corporations who do absolutely nothing to help people and, and they're kind of purposefully making it impossible for people to sort of escape their kind of buying from them Mm -hmm. or governments that won't do not care about that as on the agenda you have to remember that like corporations and governments are made of individuals too and until hopefully individuals start seeping up through as we Mm -hmm. as generations go then then that'll change but like it's like there's no you know you can blame things and have the enemies of corporates or or like political figures but I think you just gotta know that we always go through these huge dips and I think you just got to wait and ho- and hope and strive that like some great new youthful individuals will come up right. and start bleeding through all these organizations and corporations and governments and it will begin to change and shift. Which the younger generation, mm-hmm. if you will, they're really amazing. Amazing. Like inc- I'm like constantly like, okay, we're fine <laughs> if we have them. No, it's you know. true. It's yeah. uh, I've been speaking to some... Um, I spoke to this girl named Deja, who was a guest, and she's 19, Mm -hmm. and, like, called out Senator Flake when he was, you know, supporting Title X, Mm -hmm. and she was 16 years old. Wow, yeah. And her thing is she's like, I'm future POTUS. And I'm like, you're incredible. You're 19 years old, and, like, you mean business? And, like, you're fucking 19. Mm -hmm. You know, it really is incredible, I find. For sure. I mean, and, you know, with the sort of, 
climate emergency movement, I mean the children across the world, I mean millions and millions of children are striking from school, are showing up, are rallying, are getting together, are like educating themselves massively yeah. across all languages, demographics, everything. And it's like constantly incredible because you're like, you're you, like, who am I? Am yeah. I doing anything? anything? <laughs> but you are because you know that really we be we did begin to question things too. Like that's not just a random thing that they've began right. to question. Like we have obviously as generation straddled life without Both, social media, with social media. Then there's like a generation that did just only experience that. Now. And now I feel like the youth that are sort of I don't know, maybe like 18 and, and younger are beginning to be like really waking up to the, seeing yeah. the absolute, like the seeking and asking for transparency yeah. behind all these kind of public personas that people have put on. Totally. But I think that can't not come from like other people's work too. Right, yeah. So are you able, is filmmaking now like your official job? Are you able to be like, this is my job? Yeah, I mean, in the last few years, I've, you know, done more like commercials and music videos. I've more been, you know, commissioned to do, which is, you know, when those first jobs come in, that was like hugely seminal for me because, you know, the last job that I was like hired to do was acting. And so right. it was really exciting to transition and actually be like desired and wanted yeah. for that and it was like wow okay you know and you you know naturally do need that kind of validation of course, and yeah. approval that we always are looking for <laughs> um, <laughs> um but it's been it's been yeah it's been it took me a long time to even say like you know yeah i'm a director i'm a filmmaker and um and i think i don't know the more and more we realize we don't like there are so many different elements to my life that I know I'll you know I'll express things sometimes not through film or yeah, yeah I was gonna say because like so you're um separate we come separate we go that went to Cannes mm -hmm. how old are you when that happened so that was my graduation film so I would have That's been amazing. 20 21 was there like you know what was your connection to the characters because like it was yeah. so beautiful so the landscape is just by where I used to go as a kid every weekend. Right. And so for me, you know, that landscape had become such a character to me and like a mm. friend to me that I was really interested in, you know, and I still have been very interested in, you know, the spatial sort of environment that the character is in becomes as much as a character as, as they are. And that's very much like gone through all my work, even work that's more of an interior kind of urban space that's also still been the kind of message um so i guess i was really interested in i mean her character the mother is you know obviously sort of never leaves home suffering from depression you know is very much disconnected to her child um my mum having suffered from depression my entire life i was very much like open and understanding of that sort of relationship of knowing that she was always there but like it was just like a different you know it wasn't it was there, in a not. way that I couldn't I still needed to express my imagination mm -hmm. and an adventure but not feel bad that I couldn't there was actually nothing in that moment I could say as a however old yeah. child so I think taking taking that experience in my own way and, and and dramatizing it for the purpose of this story was this you know idea that obviously it's just the two of them at home I grew up you know with um, a brother and my dad so I was kind of how do I sort of condense this this experience in a way that's more dramatic I guess um, and she you know suddenly looks outside the letterbox window and, and sees and hears what's beyond and, and decides to sort of leave and, and walk off in this journey yeah so kind of like for those who haven't seen it like yeah. a very short, do you want to give yeah, like a sure. short synopsis? Um, yeah, so it's basically set in a place called Dungeness, which is in Kent on the south coast of England. Um, and it starts with a young girl who must be about eight or nine. She's so cute. Yeah, she's really sweet. And and funnily enough, she has red hair, but she was the only yeah. actress that we auditioned that had everyone else, had, you know, that wasn't part of the role yeah. description at all. So ironically, obviously, it's even more probably yeah. um, close to home. Um, and so her mother um, is kind of completely disconnected to her. She's sort of thinking that it's time to get ready for school, but it's the weekend and she just obviously can't deal with the, with the domestic 
kind of role that she has as a mother or connection to her child and 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 just goes off in her own world and the the daughter looks out of the letterbox and decides to you know go journey outside which obviously she doesn't do much and she walks um to this coastal town dungeness and as she's sort of wandering around probably thinking she's maybe walked a little bit too far and she's sort of like out there as this mm-hmm. young kid this um guy comes along played by david thewlis and who what's his character in harry potter oh yeah he played professor lupin professor yeah, lupin yeah, yeah. yeah i was like i recognize yeah, yeah yeah um and you know you're immediately like oh older guy well that's what was go on this is awkward. that what yeah. was so nice is yeah. that you and every time like maybe it's just my filter that i see a young girl and an old man i'm yeah. immediately like oh something sh- something wild bad's gonna, bad's happen, gonna sure. happen and i wanted to you know play with that for a moment but mm-hmm. then see that like clearly his love and kindness is was him it's yeah. that's his character so they kind of strike up a little conversation and and they go back to his little house and they talk about essentially you know he's lost his wife and child and they kind of talk about you know he talks about how um sort of helpful this environment has been for him to sort of grieve and and he really notices that this girl looks really serious and and not very kind of childlike and to sort of bring her and liberate liberate her out of that space he decides to just like take her out back outside and sort of run into the sunset randomly chasing after birds telling them where they should fly so it's there isn't you know it's it's it was very much this idea that you know journeying outside to come inside to sort of like go out to sort of feel yourself a little bit more in in the sort of spontaneity that nature can sometimes give you and and sort of for this young girl who had to grow up fast because of having to sort of mother herself essentially do you feel like you had that experience yeah i mean i think from all things i think from yeah. you know, experience of acting or experience of i mean i think i was very much like mothered a lot um in multiple ways in terms of from my own mother from being on set you're kind of there is a mother kind of energy on that set because you are being looked after and taken care of who directed the harry potter films and where was it all the same or did it switch up uh it switched up so we had christopher columbus direct the first two um and he he was so brilliant i mean his experience obviously has been so much with child actors so he's really good at making you Mm -hmm. feel like you were there and independent like he had a very amazing way of you know upon only kind of realizing that now and he really created that foundation of family and then we had alfonso cron direct the third one and then who brought a whole different kind of dark edge to it that was great and needed and then mike newell directed the fourth one um and he was great and fun and then we had david yates direct like the all men yeah all men yeah yeah i've only ever been directed by two women wow yeah out of you know probably like yeah 12 15 men so i feel like i have to ask you about how it was being a Mm nine-year-old getting put in those movies because i will say i loved harry potter and it was always like a safe movie for me to watch i don't know maybe it was the imagination part you know but like how how did that happen because if you said you didn't want to act you never acted how did you end up in that situation um so i my brother lewis who's about two three years older than me he had read the first two books and really loved them and and then people started hearing that they were going to make them into you know there's obviously already a bit of following to the books and people heard that we're going to make into into movies and that they were auditioning for the roles and and my brother was like you should play the role of Ginny weasley and i was like who's that we're like who's you know? that <laughs> who's that i'm eight <laughs> yeah <laughs> and you know for him being my older brother she's very much like the little sister role mm-hmm. so in his mind very clear like good casting yeah um and my mom came home from work and i was like mom mom i want to audition in harry potter and she's like what like lewis like what do what <laughs> think what do you why are you <laughs> like seeding these ideas into her brain um and she was like okay i don't know how that's you know not in the entertainment industry at all but being a very um loving mother and like patient with my request she um called the publishers the english so we had in the UK, are, they have Scholastic here, but in the UK, it was Bo- Bloomsbury that published okay. books. So she called the publishers and they're like, uh, okay, here's the number to the casting director's office. So then got through to the casting director's office. Wow. And then, yeah, and then they were like, okay, yeah, if you could just send some pictures of Bonnie and, 
and and could she write like a sentence about like what character she'd want to play in the film and like why so I wrote my little what sentence. What was it? I don't know. My mum still has it. I need to get it back yeah. out. Yeah. And then a few photos. And that must and be such a cute sentence. Yeah, it must have been like, I think that yeah. I... <laughs> I have red hair yeah. and blue eyes. And perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and so then I went for an audition with the casting director. And, you know, there's no... Ginny has no lines. She didn't until the day of. I got added a little line, but... I didn't have any, like, not enough to audition for. So I just read other characters for the audition. And, and then we didn't hear from for a while. And I was like, cool, that was fun. Like, it was not, right. I was the kid who, like, loved taking part. Like, I wanted to be in, show up to everything. But it wasn't, like, very interesting. Like, I was really into sports and doing those things. Right. But I was, like, the least competitive person. I was, like, <laughs> down, just down. Very down, still down for the cars, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, so we were like, that was funny and fun. Because, like, my brother came with me and my mum. And, and then they called quite a while later. And they were like, can you come back for an audition to meet, you know, Chris Columbus, the director, and David Heyman, the producer. And my mum's like, oh, it's come back around. <laughs> <laughs> so we went to the studios where I ended up then spending 10 years of my life. But we went to the studios there. And and there were, like, different people who were not for the same role, but there were, like, different people in the waiting room auditioning who end up being some of like the roles really in this one, yeah. and I remember I just remember I mean I remember every moment of it so vividly and and I just said you know did read the same scene and chatted to them and and then I just we just left and it was just like that was weird and fun and and then we found out and my brother and I were we were in the car driving to our house on the beach and my brother and I were like mom and dad are being really weird like they're being strange you know you just pick up when like yeah, yeah, parents are being strange and then halfway through the journey they're like so um you got a phone call you know about the audition and uh so well they want they want you to play the part oh and my, my brother God. and I were like so we rolled down the windows we we're on the you know motorway freeway driving yeah. really fast and we're like screaming out the window oh. <laughs> and then we were like what now because we, you know, everything yeah, was so yeah, new. Yeah. And it was, you know, that first set, that day, stepping on set for the first time. I was going to say, I literally say didn't what? know anything. I mean, who's to tell you, like, this is how a film set works and this is what all this terminology means. I was... Were the other kids, did they have more experience? Like, well, um, no, I mean, a lot of people, it was their first film. But, you know, they'd already been shooting by that point for, you know, a good month or two. So I was coming in for just, like, you know, three days in the first film and... And yeah, it was just, it was all new and it was, it was kind of cool. And Julie Walters, who played my mother in, in the films, very much like grabbed hold of my hand and was my Aww. mother throughout the process. So then I, then later on you got engaged to one of your co-stars. <laughs> yeah. and you're like, I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, I did. When was that? that How did was, that happen? It's like one of those dream scenarios. Yeah, you like dream or yeah, some <laughs> or sort nightmare, of dream, some sort of vortex <laughs> of a dream. I mean, yeah, it's was kind it? of you realize. I mean, at that age as well. I mean, How old were you? Before I was nineteen. I love that. I yeah. really respect. Yeah. a young engagement. Yeah. I and guess. a call off. <laughs> yeah. You're like, oh my God, I'm so young and don't know anything. How did that happen? Please tell me. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was one of those like, for, you know, first time fully falling head over heels in love. Yeah. And we were, it was just like this kind of obsessive sort of love that's so kind of intense that what we was all feel. Name? Jamie. Jamie. Bauer. Yeah. Okay. Who's he? Is he with someone now? He, I think he is, yeah. We don't, we're not really in each other's world. Well, no, anymore. I know, but I feel <laughs> like he has some girlfriend now. Maybe not. There was, like, times where different people that we know, but, like, Right, okay, off, no. If that makes sense. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but, yeah, I don't know. I mean, that was just, like, woo, like, what, like, complete... It's it's like a vacation boyfriend, Fully. but like I, you know, in Hogwarts. I, yeah, for sure. But we, interestingly, <laughs> we had finished the films by then, like shooting. We didn't like meet on the sets, for instance. Like, oh, really? No, no, yeah. We I was imagining you guys having no, some like yeah. really cute Hogwarts yeah. romance. <laughs> we met in uh, the Great Hall. <laughs> he was Slytherin, I was Gryffindor. <laughs> the, the way Romeo he used Julia. that yeah. wand. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my god. That's so okay, so did 
were there other like romances on you don't have to tell me names but just tell me were no, there romances on set, no. on I set? mean there were but like I was not surprised at not as many as you'd assume I mean there were and obviously there was so many crew members to that film was there ever well. weird shit with child actors or was everyone like you know chill? what I think because we were like kids being kids together it was like way more normal because it wasn't like I'm the only kid on this adult set mm-hmm. and I'm having to sort of like grow up in a really bizarre environment like it was we were still like goofy and naive and like just doing silly yeah. things and still kind of being teenagers you know yeah and yeah obviously we go we you know we went all of us literally went through puberty and like right. all these huge milestones that you go through during that process are so, they like your family yeah and it's this weird it's such a difficult experience to explain to people that when i meet up with you know friends that we went through it together it's like ah oh, this is like relief yeah. that you just like you get it and you know and you can sort of chat and reflect upon that experience and i think we've become it's been really lovely like seeing and having time go by and seeing everyone including myself coming sort of to a you know greater deeper understanding of like the good and bad of that experience and and sort of like where we're all at now and having a little bit more kind of just a release of it in a positive way to be able to like actually fully celebrate it and realize Mm -hmm. how amazing it was whereas you come out of that thing and you're trying to just like be normal and have this normal life that you're kind of pushing it down slightly rather than being rather than well of course everywhere you go you're like oh my god it's Jenny Weasley yeah yeah Yeah. and and you know you're suddenly wanting to figure out who you are and so yeah you've been this person has been put on you you've been living and breathing this character and person like for your childhood and it becomes really bizarrely intertwined you know I'm sure you're kind of like who's who is Is that me right her am I Yeah. yeah so what do you think was the like but out of the whole experience like what was the best part of it cool um i guess getting exposed to you know an industry and a level of sort of making that was just so inspirational to me clearly because i've gone on to sort of stay in the industry but in my own kind of like way and i've been so pleased that I guess the experience didn't kind of completely make me run away from it. You know, it really embraced me and embraced like a part of my kind of, ex- you know, expression and, and everything in a way that comes from, like I was saying before, that craftsmanship, that like real respect for yeah storytelling and creating a world. Like I was, full you know, I world. Lo- full world. And yeah. in my own way, in my own films, you know, I've realized no matter what scale you're doing, you're still like your world is still like valid that you're creating because you came from this like anything was possible, obviously, in those productions. Yeah. So it was like, we're just going to build this. You're like, cool. And they go yeah. build this amazing thing. But it just shows that you can build, you know, worlds and escape through them. And I think that's what why I love be, having been part of of the Harry Potter world is that everyone you meet is always like so sort of like excited and thankful and grateful that it was part of their life in some way whether or not it's like a parent being like oh my gosh those movies made my children read like they wouldn't have ever read a book or like I was bullied at school and these films were everything to me and I you know escaped through them and and you just hear such yeah incredible stories that people have found such solace in them that's cool it's really cool yeah that's true it's it is such a good vibe that it really can bring such joy. Like I was just saying, like I always felt so safe watching them for some reason, yeah. and it just uh, transported me to a different place. Like I always would watch it when I was feeling bombed about something. Mm-hmm. You know, it is. It's got a really. Po- it can. It makes a really positive impact. Like you're not walking away from that feeling shitty, which not is really all. cool yeah. to be able to like have an imprint of that on other people's lives yeah and I think what's really cool about it which for some kind of popular culture big movies they kind of have a bit of a sell by date or like they kind of Mm -hmm. don't become watched again until they have a revival whereas these movies you know you meet these kids who are like seven and they're like huge fans and they weren't obviously around when the movies were coming out but they're as much into it yeah as you know our age of people were so it's cool to see that it's like still just like being recycled through generations yeah and now you have 
that platform and yeah. you get to do all these amazing things mm-hmm. with them yeah you know like yeah I mean it's incredible I mean to speak to people and feel like you can share your own passions and interests and be heard and and inspire people in a kind of subtle kind of way is is really incredible and to know that like it's I think I'm, I'm very aware that like the audience that I have to speak to, you know, their most powerful thing that they have is their choice and the way they spend their time and the choices they take rather than maybe some people who are speaking to people who can donate huge amounts of money to a mm. cause. Like I know the people I'm speaking to, it's about their like individual actions and habits and like things that they can do and to make them feel like they're really important choices is yeah. cool because that's not, they don't need to be choices necessarily out of, as I was saying, access, privilege, whatnot. Yeah. They can be very simple things to to do and be aware of. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that that's super cool. For real. It yeah. is. It's like an amazing journey, I bet. Like, what a trip. And now yeah, you're here in sure. Venice. I know. You know? It's been a trip, for sure. Yeah. So... What do you think, like, super easy, like, top three things or something that are, like, super easy switches mm-hmm. for people to make that would, like, make a big difference in yeah. environmental stuff? And then... Yeah, yeah sure. Um, so, I'm sure it's always, like, people always start with a plastic water bottle, but it is a really easy thing to... You know, if you do have access to buying a reusable bottle, even just using, like, an old mason jar or an old something, something that you have that you can refill... Um, and know that just, you know, even if when you travel, you're like, I just can't do that, then that's fine. But even in your day-to-day, whether or not that's within your car or on your way to work, if you have that access to having a reusable, and that could stem through to your reusable for coffee or iced coffee, you know, that's a huge impact you're going to make. I was going to ask, so, like, when you go to the coffee shop, do you mm. give them your own? Yeah. So oh. I have, re- I have like, a cup that's just, like, for iced coffee that's just, like, a aluminium cup and then I have a keep cup which is the the original like reusable for like hot drinks um I mean the beauty of those is like a they stay hotter longer because they have like a lid mm-hmm. thing that you can keep them hot yeah. and they're kind of like they don't spill everywhere if you're in your car or running you know yeah. to the subway or whatever um and I mean it's like shocking to look up statistics of how many you know cups like a minute that we kind of consume um and so they're like easy ones reusable ones and then what is your take on the like hay straws mm. and the like paper straws? Like, is that okay? I mean, you know, the ultimate goal with anything is no waste. You know, we, right. we need to really drastically stop the waste that we're creating. Um, sorry, that's my. I like, know. The trash I, you know what? <laughs> um, the as real we're talking life about shit. Things, yeah. Um, <laughs> the garbage. Yeah. <laughs> comes by um so in the ideal world it's like age you need a straw we just got so used to using them that we don't really need them like Mm. can you just sit from something whereas you know in some situations people do need straws which i fully understand but in in that sense the reusable is the best thing you know if you can buy like a metal glass one that is better than a paper straw so obviously loads of different things are coming around i mean glass is infinitely recyclable and the quality of glass never diminishes as it's being recycled whereas other things will always lose its kind of properties like plastic when it's recycled won't be as kind of high grade plastic Mm -hmm. it will begin to lose its kind of um strength do Um, you do compost recycle trash yes yeah Um, do you have trash yeah, okay. I'm not. I'm not. I, 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 I commend and respect people who can live a complete zero waste lifestyle, but I think it's really, really difficult. And yeah. it's, you know, a lot of these things come with like, do you have the time to pre plan and, and decide mm-hmm. that, you know, oh, you got to, and you know, these things remember it, you know, I, I got the cup, but I forget it. And I'm like, well, do you forget your phone ever? Like, you don't, you know, you, you can yeah, yeah, create yeah. these things to be really important if we if we make them like a non-negotiable thing, Mm -hmm. then they become something we'll just always remember. Mm -hmm. Um, But you know, pre-planning, like if you're gonna take your lunch to work and things like that to avoid going to get takeout that has all the packaging, like it's carving that time out, but obviously we don't all have time, you know? And maybe, you know, even if it's like two days out of the week, you're able to have that time. That's hugely beneficial. It's like, what can you do on like a small, realistic level? I mean, a huge way, uh, as we become a more convenient culture 
the big offender is takeaway food delivery packaging. it's yeah. delivery it's like all the plastic you know bag that comes in and they're gonna give you loads of your utensils even though you're at home yeah um yeah i mean the things that i always travel with me everywhere is my reusable keep cup my plastic water bottle and i have like a it's a company called to go wear that are these little like um set of bamboo like kind of heavy duty um utensils that are in this little pouch and you just keep them in your bag because even if you are okay i couldn't save the fact that my salad's in a plastic box i didn't ask for the cu- the utensils i have my own that's a huge you can control yeah, yeah, that yeah, yeah. whereas okay. them packaging you something sometimes you just can't there are things yeah. you can't control but hopefully they'll change yeah and i would just be very aware of you know there's lots of companies now using things that are made out of compostable plastics or plastics made from plants sadly those packaging although they're sort of probably thinking they're doing a good thing the coffee shop or whatever those cups cannot be they need to be recycled in like industrial machines composting oh, wow. machines they're not like things you could throw in a plant pot and it'll de- degrade like they're just too heavy duty they need stronger and now what's happening with a lot of people's waste management systems shoot <laughs> um, people are putting them in the recycling bin and then they're messing up the systems that we do have huh. in place so it's, I think with all these things like some things will like advance quickly and then we're yeah. like oh wait a minute that's actually maybe we didn't think that through so I think we're, that's the time we're in right now you need all these to things do are a, happening and we're like figuring it out you need to do a reusable bottle collaboration it's true yeah you should do that but I think with all these things like I agree but then I'm like any bottle at this point you know no, what I mean I like, know. any bottle my, will save anything my creative yeah. I'm like it'd be so cute yeah, you could do no, different no, colors yeah. with different prints <laughs> no, yeah my brain goes swimsuits there too. part two then I'm like just anything or yeah. often I, you know I have all these ideas and I'm like I wish that would happen and most of the time I just want someone else to go hopefully do the idea because mm. you know there's so many concepts that I'll run with so that fun. I would just love someone to pick up just because I don't have the capacity to do that, but someone would. And do, and like what? And then I'll and then I'll let you go. But like, <laughs> no, what, yeah. do you, what do you mean? Um, I mean, a big thing that you know, I have as I've tried to phase out, you know, my use and you know, consumption of single-use plastics. I've tried to look through my household products, my mm. my kitchen, my beauty, and and a big one that's really really difficult is like household cleaning products. Is like near right. impossible. Like you can maybe make some choices of beauty that's like choosing soap over um you know shower gel that's a huge change that you like can make a soap like bar. a bar, so- bar of soap rather than shower gel in a plastic bottle you know uh. just simple things like that like anyone you know, we all have access to that you can buy bars yeah. of soap um but the household products i f- like near impossible to go mm-hmm. and find something and more and more now different refill shops are opening up and cool. and it's great and you can go refill them but like at this moment because they're it's a niche market they're expensive and they're hard to access and especially in LA everything's like it's not like on my walk home you know Mm -hmm. it's a drive away so I think my thing I'm really into how do we make refillable things in in a in a store that is like you know whether that's a Walmart a Ralph's a Target like an access point where everyone can go to and that is still a price match for the products like that come from Tide or Seventh Generation or all those things. So that has been my, like, I just did this um, course at UCLA on sustainability and that was like my final project. So the Green New Deal. Yes. She want, they want to completely get rid of air travel, right? Yeah, I mean, there are, with all these like deals and goals and agreements and by 20s, you know, some far off thing, it's yeah. like, they are obviously really important because policy needs to protect us. That's what it's meant mm-hmm. to do and protect our, you know, home and environment. But I think sometimes the things are like, you know, they're put into place and then who's checking that they're being actually happening kept to, you know? So right. I think that's a hard thing. It's like having faith in those things. You know, we obviously are putting me included, trying to put those things, you know, at to the f- forefront of the agenda and what needs to be addressed. But it's like, I then can have moments and I'm like, we can put these in place, but is it going to be kept? Or are we going to, like, what does that even mean? Is that realistic? Yeah. I don't know. I think it's just, I think it's important though, because then we can't, like, I do truly believe that like, we have, like I was saying, we only have our own individual action at the end of the Mm -hmm. day. That's all we can really control. But also really to make things accessible and for everyone to do, laws need to be in place like things need to be banned things need to be like companies can't 
package something in you know a certain type of material they have to provide certain better waste management systems and until those things are policy driven and protected like the every man can't do that right well those are all super helpful little bits and like it's good to know that those little things do matter they do because yeah. it can they be really the do. daunting thing of like well what's the point we're fucked anyways mm-hmm. or whatever but knowing that those little things do really help is good yeah knowing that just you know you make small simple choice but you know that just like by committing to that choice that's gonna like naturally you know seep into other elements of your mm-hmm. life just stopping to think for a second oh wait maybe i don't need that for a minute yeah you'll then be like oh wow maybe i don't it's just that's what it's taught me it's been like yeah. oh maybe i'm not gonna have that because it is wrapped in plastic and i can just wait till i get home to have something or actually i'm gonna opt for something else instead of that it's just like slowed these knee-jerk reactions i would have made because of course we didn't know anything better or else because yeah. for so long that's been like okay mm-hmm. and normal to get that totally but yeah, it's, I think it's just choosing one small little thing that you can commit to. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for having yeah. me in your home. Of course. I thank really you. I appreciate it's been great. it. Great and time. yeah, I wish you all the best with all your directing and like thank writing. You. It's super exciting. I think you're really talented. So. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you.